So this is an interspinous process fusion device. And the, the specific device we're doing is the only interspinous process fusion device that we have today. It's called the, uh, the Minuteman by Spinal <coughs> Simplicity. And so this is going to be a lateral-based approach. It's going to be uh, through an incision that's about uh, two and a half centimeters. And it is designed to promote and provide a fusion and distraction of the interspinous processes. So this is a little bit different approach than the, the Vertiflex Superion. It comes from a lateral-based uh, approach. And we'll size it very similar to the Superion approach. And uh, we'll go ahead and demonstrate that right now. So go ahead and come on in. We'll do most of this from the lateral approach. We did four or five previously, so I'll focus on three, four. Can we have a shot there? A little bit shot there. All right, so this is about the, uh, can we come a little bit coddly? There we go. This way. Turn the eye eye coddle, please. And shoot, shoot that. All right, so picture that. So we'll start right about, picture that, at this level. And then we'll go all the way to the side. And this is just to the outside of the multivitus. So we're going to swing lateral. And at this point, we'll be just lateral to the iliocostalis muscle. And the idea is to start between the spinous processes. So raise up a little bit, if you would, please. So we're at 3, 4. And the spinous processes always are slope posterior. They go from superior to inferior. Raise up just a little bit more. So we want to get the spinous processes visualized right there. So we can see that this is exactly our start point. We're right between L3 and L4 spinous process. I'm going to make an incision right here. And then we are going to go progressively down until we reach that point as anterior as we can get it. Picture. And to the location between the spinous processes picture. And we'll guide that just a little bit inferior. Picture. And so we're starting to feel a little bit of bone right there, picture. And that's looking pretty good so far. We're in the area right between the spinous processes picture. And so at this point in time, we're just directly posterior to the inferior articular process. We're between the spinous processes. Let's come back AP. So you can't see the spinous processes as well on your screen as we can on the floral monitor. Yes. But as you can see with Doug, he's about a third of the way back from that spinal laminar line of the articular processes. Exactly. But. And so we're going to come back AP and kind of see where we are on a medial lateral because you can get hung up on the facet. So we're actually right where we want to be. So we're across, and I'm going to send this over to the level of the contralateral pedicle. Picture that. So that's very good right there. And now we're going to start our series of dilations. So we start off with the small dilators, and these are tapered. Shoot. And we'll see a series of dilation. And these are the uh, older style dilators that are a little bit more radiopaque, which is better. I like these. Picture for demonstration. We'll dilate all the way up to the 20 millimeter. Shoot that. Series of progressive dilations. And this is uh, sleeve one. So this is 20 millimeters. And we'll dilate it here. And then we're going to, after we insert this, I'm going to kind of shift gears. Picture that. OK, good. So we'll dilate up here. We'll remove the internal dilators. And we will attach the extension for the Steinman pin. And these are rightward threads, so righty-tighty. And then over this, we're going to put, it's called the graduated tap. So this has a proximal T handle. It also has holes. And these holes are sized the same as what we'd previously seen. These are sized. Um, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. And I'll show you how this works. And so we put this in as a completely threaded from 
front to back. And this is place, and we can take a shot there. So this is starting to go through the inner spinous space. And this is, because this is threaded, this goes in with continuous steady pressure like a wood screw. And this will bite the spinous processes, will disrupt the cortex a little bit, picture, will cause a little bit of bleeding, which is good because this is a fusion spacer and the bone graft, the bone window that we, is a, it varies between less than two centimeters to about two and a half uh, millimeter, milliliters. And this is uh, a big bone graft window. And so we'll take a, a few bites at this. I'm gonna align the proximal laser line up with the eye eye. There's a laser line here that I can see. And I'm gonna pull the, the wire back and you'll be able to see the holes, and so we can see we're past eight. <clears throat> we're going to 10, and I'm gonna keep on going a little bit more until <clears throat> the combination of, of what we think would be nice. So the indications for this <clears throat> is generally degenerative disc disease, but it also, uh, the indication that I like mostly is uh, something that has degenerative disc disease with pain and a little bit of stenosis, and so you have something like the set joint gaps, you have um, a little bit of spinal thesis, anteroposterior picture, or lateral based, and we'll shoot that. So we're almost to the 12, and just like the sizing for the previous spacer, we're gonna size past our target, and this is going to be a little bit past 12 to put in a 12, and I can kind of feel, picture, so we do this combination with radiographic appearance. Let's swing lateral to check our position. And also feel when it starts to get tight, whenever this starts to tighten up and the inner spinous space stops giving and starts showing resistance, that, that's the other way that we know that we're in the right spot. And most of these, just as in most inner spinous process devices, these will be mostly 12 and 14 millimeters. And so this is, the grad, this is called the graduated tap. All right, so we see we're right directly posterior to the inferior articular process, and we're pretty happy about our position. So I'm gonna take this off. We'll come back around AP, take the handle off. Then I'm gonna dilate all the way up to uh, 26 millimeters. And there's two more, two more dilators. Make sure that I'm gonna leave the graduated tap in for the purpose of ligamentotaxis. And we can see these are, more aluminum components, and they're a lot more radiolucent than the previous ones. Picture. And good position here. With this, I'm gonna take out the <coughs> internal dilators. We're gonna <coughs> use a 12. And I'm gonna leave this in place until the very last minute. We also have, so this is the inserter. Okay inserter, so we have the uh, knobology of this. So this is the uh, plunger stop right here. This is the plunger knob. We're gonna do everything in clockwise. And this is um, the fixed plate knob. And this is the inserter, and all the way toward the end of the inserter is the implant. This is sized appropriately. This is the fixed plate here. The extension plate you can't see, but I'll show you this, and this will we'll, uh, do the plunger knob and the, the, the ex, or the extension plate knob, and this, these will expand, and this is the bone graft packed in here. This white stuff is a, is a mock-up of bone graft. And uh, the bone graft we use, DVM, DBX. I use NanoFuse. There's a bunch of different varieties of bone graft you can use. Everybody has one. And on this, the last step, you'll take this out, is the graduated tap, you'll just loosen it up, taking it out, using an inserter, and this is also fully threaded, so you insert it by going righty tighty. Uh, let's do AP shot, good. And we can see this going through, picture. So the fixed plate is one that you see with the teeth. The extension plate has wings, and they're like a bird with his wings uh, tucked in. Picture that. And we'll drive it all the way across as we see. Let's go ahead and shoot that again. And then we're gonna line up the laser lines. This has reference lines. It says wing reference right here. 
and we're going to line this top to bottom because this is how the extension plate is going to open up. And I'm going to do flip this. And I'm going to do clockwise on the back knob, and we can shoot that. And so we can see this start to open up. Shoot again. We can see it open way up. And then I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to go to the fixed plate knob, and again clockwise, rotating this. And this has a lot more turns than the other one, so I'm going to turn it quite a bit. Picture that, and we can see that the extension plate is being pulled toward the fixed plate. Shoot that. Again, more turns. Picture. And it's being pulled. And picture again. And before we get quite at the point where we lock this down, I'm going to go lateral. So I want to make sure that our extension plate is superior inferior and locks into the spinous processes. This is what we want to make sure of. That's good, right there. Kind of a almost lateral, right? And so if anything, the superior uh, plate could probably go a little bit more ventral. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the angulation like this, picture. And that is pretty good, straight up and down. Picture that again. Kind of like that, that's good. And I'm gonna go ahead and continue to turn clockwise and lock this in, picture that. Really like that position right there. Picture? Yeah, and we're locking it in. Let's go back around AP. And this is three finger tight is how we're gonna do this. And at this point in time, we don't really have a lot of AP lateral, AP lateral. We just kind of really focus a lot on accomplishing most of the goals. And this is uh, completely locked down there. The extension plate to the fixed plate. And at this point in time, I'm gonna go counterclockwise on the posterior knob, counterclockwise, give it a couple of shakes and shoot that. We'll go ahead and take the sleeve out picture. And that is the final AP view. Let's go ahead and take a final lateral view so we can show everybody how this is. And over time, I just, <clears throat> I just reviewed a series of these. Uh, you know, I've heard things like, well, these don't fuse, and this is, uh, the spinous processes don't really grow that much bone. I can tell you that based on uh, my assessment of fusion, and this, was, and this is a final lateral view there, based on uh, my assessment of fusion on CT, this has a fusion rate of 96% at least in the series that I looked at. And so the pseudoarthrosis rate for inner, inner body fusion, you know, it varies. You could say five to 8% is, is pretty reasonable. So this appears to be every bit as good as that. And uh, this is a fusion spacer. This is a percutaneous fusion spacer, the only one on the market that's available currently. I, last time I looked, there's 45 IPDs. Um, and most of these are fusion spacers. Most of these are done open. This is about two and a half centimeter incision. Uh, and this is uh, surprisingly little pain. Most of this has to do with dilation and uh, you dilate it up. And then whenever, whenever you pull out the, the tubes, the current tube is 26 millimeters. The future tube is going to be uh, in the range of 20 millimeters. You'll be able to put everything all the way up to a 14 through a 20 millimeter tube. So this is, um, a fusion interspinous process device called the Minuteman by Spinal Simplicity. That was awesome, Doug. Thank you so much. Yep. So do you guys have any questions based on that demonstration? Yes, please. Um, just in comparison to the last device we saw that you said had to be more anterior, this being more Great question. So, uh, Doug, I'll, I'll take this one if you don't mind. The, qu the question was with the VertiFlex procedure, you know, we, we really want it to be as anterior as possible towards the spinal laminar line. And with the Minuteman, the interspinous clamp, is that as important? And, and the, the biggest differentiating factor be the, between these two vices, and it was really cool for you guys to see them back to back, is that the VertiFlex, what I did, there is no fixation. That just sits there. And those cam lobes basically guide the spinous processes, oh, sure. but it can move. You know, not a great deal. It's never dislodged per the IDE, and I haven't, I haven't seen a dislodgement. Uh, but it can move a little bit. It's not fixated. The interspinous clamp, and that's the reason I use the word clamp, is it's cinching, there's bone graft, there's hydroxyapatite, all leading to a fusion construct. So once it's fused, 
uh, you really can't cause any further issues unless there's a major, you know, torque event or something like that where a spinous process may fracture, especially in someone with osteoporosis. But as you saw with Doug's demonstration, which was textbook, he put it in the anterior third to anterior middle line right there. And that's really, from a biomechanical standpoint, the ideal place for that. But that fusion process will occur over the next several weeks, and, and then you don't have to worry about that issue. Great, great, great question. Yes? Do we do one versus the other? Doug, what do you think? So any type of completely stable stenosis is a vertiflex case for me. Anything with instability, the set joint gapping, spinal listhesis, that's a fusion spacer. That's a minimum case for me. So uh, either the Sabotkin paper, spinous process anatomy, people don't seem to know about spinous processes as much as other bones of the spine. The strongest spinous processes are L2 and L3. The weakest is L5. The, more, the strongest cortex is as far anterior as you can go. And so if you can have something that holds on to the lamina, it's also stronger rather than to hold the spinous process like a prayer book. So we need to keep in the consideration all of these anatomical peculiarities about the spine and spinous processes. You want to be sure and be as anterior as you possibly can. These will fuse. They fuse at a much higher rate than what I thought. I did, and this is recently, this evaluation I completed a week ago. And, it, and this is hot off the press. It's not been published. Nobody knows about it. Fusion rate, 96%. So people that tell you these things don't fuse, that's completely false. I mean, that's based on their no, no data. The data that says these, these will, in fact, fuse. But that's how you separate it. So any instability, fusion spacer, stable spinal stenosis is a superion, vertiflex superion. Yeah. Any other questions? Perfect. I, I think the only thing I'll add is that uh, this this device is is really you know very unique in how it's done as Doug already mentioned. It can address some of the issues that might occur with Vertiflex. The only caveat is right now we just don't have that level one evidence to say that this works for five years or whatever else. That's coming. I mean they know that we know that. So you know just wait for it. It'll be there. Vertiflex. You do have one study five year, and Boston Scientific has invested in a second study. Uh, and that really changes the reimbursement for the payers to authorize, cover, et cetera. So again, this is one of those technologies where it's early, but if you hold on to it and we can prove that it works for the right patients, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to run away. So if, when you hear about the criticism from AANS doing these kinds of procedures in our hands, when you hear, oh, you, should, you guys should be doing it, we're still trying to figure that out. doesn't mean we should stop doing it, but we have to go about it the right way. And so we'll get there. We're early, but nonetheless, we'll get there. So safety and efficacy. So the lateral approach, there's nothing there. There's paraspinal muscles. And you can see the trajectories like this, even a little bit like this. That's how it got so far anterior. To You go from this to the neural foramina or the canal. The, because it's such a long le lever arm, you can see it from the, the back table back there. I mean, you, you'd have to really be like this. And to go hit the vertebral body like this and hit the the uh, anywhere in the peritoneum is so this is completely safe swath of territory there's there's nothing at all to hit back there and and you can see you know i can i can see when tyler does these you know from across the room that he's at the right angle just because it's uh, there's such a big lever arm efficacy there's a uk data a set of 44 patients that said it's as good or better than laminectomy at getting rid of symptoms of neurogenic intermittent claudication. It's better at getting equal for back pain, better in terms of getting rid of leg pain. And a surgical procedure, it was faster, safer, less blood loss. And so compared to laminectomy, it's as good or better, better in terms of leg pain. And it was uh, safer, no, less complications, uh, and, and faster. So that's kind of safety and efficacy of this so far. And as Ramo mentioned, we're uh, we're trying to we're going to start a registry, start a level one trial, competitive trials, comparing this to non-surgical management, comparing this to laminectomy, and uh, this is something that we we really need to have data to support this. But as current data looks really pretty optimal. Yes, great. Have you guys done these, or would you consider doing them to someone who is uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I've done probably eight or nine of those. 
Uh, so you increase the risk. You put a lot of strain on that 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 poor solitary uh, orphaned lamina that still remains because the other one has been removed. His twin is gone, and now he's he's left to bear all this load. But it still works. You know, we, and I also do spinous process augmentation. That's a little bit off topic, but spinous process augmentation works. It helps prevent symptom recurrence. But if you do that and somebody's the, the lamina has been removed. You better be careful about it. So don't be doing spinous process augmentation in the face of a laminectomy unless you're really prepared to, to, uh, to uh, look and see if that is extravasating into the canal. Uh, having said that, it, it, does, it does seem to work. And most of these patients are like the ones you're thinking about. They, they had a laminectomy, they don't really have much of a surgical option. They're just waiting to, for you to do something. And if you, they're given the choice between not having anything done in one of this, I'll, I'll take a little chance on them.